when it comes to mental health, the conversations are usually not so simple. And within the black community, the conversations are usually non-existent. Black and ethnic minority groups tend to be less likely to seek mental health support. Why? Because we are fine. Take me, for example. Dad's really sick. I'm fine. Dad's dead. OK, so I was sad for a moment there because, you know, it's socially acceptable to be sad when someone dies. And I was only 18, but now I'm fine. Daughter's dad left me. I'm fine. Child's life-changing diagnosis. I'm fine. Miscarriage one. I'm fine. Miscarriage two. I'm fine. Miscarriage three. I'm fine. I'm fine. I am fine. Except I'm not fine. Of course I'm not fine. How could I be fine? I am Rachel. I have anxiety and depression. And I stand before you today as an example of a black woman, a black person who did not seek help until I hit rock bottom. And even then, even though I was living proof of the fact that black women are more likely than our white counterparts to experience mental health issues, if you had asked me how I was, I would have told you that I am fine. I told the first doctor who tried to give me a stress-related sick note that I was fine too, and I got away with it. Overly emotional things like depression aren't really a black thing. In fact, the idea is memeable. Depressed who? Where? For what? But I knew some things didn't, didn't quite feel right. My supplement drawer was overflowing with all of the vitamins and minerals under the sun because I knew that whatever it was that needed to be fixed was inside me. But I woke up one morning with a really terrible headache, went to the GP expecting to be sent away with some painkillers and some sleeping pills because I was very tired. But instead, I left with a sick note, an antidepressant prescription, and a little card with the contact details for counselling. It has been proven that black communities are less likely to be referred to talking therapies and more likely to be medicated when it comes to mental health issues. But I was one of the lucky ones because I was offered both. My mum flushed away the antidepressants that her doctor tried to give her many years ago when she came to England from the Caribbean, and she rebuked the entire depression thing in the name of Jesus. There was no mention of talking therapies for her, and even if there had been, the offer would have been declined because she was fine. You see, my mum grew up with the belief that to have mental health issues meant that you were crazy. And the crazy people got locked up in the asylum that had bars in the window and they received electric shock therapy. There was absolutely no way my mum was going to associate herself with any of that. When Britain's best love boxer, in my humble opinion, suffered a nervous breakdown in 2003, the Sun newspaper decided it would be a brilliant idea to run with the front page headline, Bonkers Bruno Locked Up. And according to them, he was locked up because he was depressed. My mum grew up with this story. Different country, different time, same narrative. The crazy people get locked up. I grew up surrounded by what I perceived to be strong black role models, just getting on with life. And that is what I tried to emulate. My sister 
went to university passing with a 2-1. What I saw was her just getting on with it. What I did was compliment her on her figure. What I missed was the fact that she was hearing voices in her head and her drastic weight loss was due to stress. But she said she was fine. We were all fine, apart from the fact that we were all most definitely living with high-functioning depression. Let me explain. In public, I was great at being fine. I pretended to be fine really, really, really well. To the outside world, I was in control. I had it together. I was the epitome of black girl magic because that is what I was supposed to be. For me, the hashtag created on Twitter in 2013 had become both a badge of honour that I did not ever want to lose and a noose around my neck that I wanted to loosen just a little. Pressure. How could I be seen to have issues and also be magical. The captions posted for the world to see never said, had a mental breakdown, hashtag black girl magic. That was not a thing. The breakdowns would happen alone. Mentally and physically drained from having been normal all day, I would step out of my clothes and into my bed, wake up, freshen up, Slay the day all black girl magically, come home and repeat. But the inside of my brain was like an unstable mental health edition of Jenga, which I continued to stack up until it all came crashing down. My dad was a part of that tower. He'd retired early due to ill health, and as a result, he was usually home when I got home from school. He couldn't walk very far or even talk towards the end. And there were oxygen tanks dotted around the house that he would hook himself up to when he found it really hard to breathe. And there were the times when I would come home from school and he'd be sitting in his armchair alone in the dark. But he said he was fine, and I chose to allow him to be just that. Because he was my dad, a good, strong, proud, black man. I used to avoid visiting him in hospital, because I didn't want him to have to be vulnerable in front of me. And I definitely did not want my last image of him to be him hooked up to machines in a hospital bed. On the night I ran out with my friends, Dad had made a huge pot of chicken soup with extra dumplings, and he was sitting in his armchair when I left, and he was fine, and then he was dead. And the next day, or maybe even the day after that, I sat sipping on the last ever chicken soup that my dad would ever make. And after 18 years of living in the same house as him, I was forced to admit just how far from fine he had been. But not me though. At the funeral, I was strong. I was even proud of the fact that I'd been brave and not made too much of a scene. I just added the event to the ever-growing Jenga tower in my head and persevered. It wasn't the first but the second attempt at calling a spade a spade that saw me accept the depression diagnosis. 
My first counsellor was another black girl who appeared to be around my age. And although most would assume that these similarities would have been a comfort, for me, they were a nightmare. It was embarrassing. I felt ashamed and I wanted to leave immediately. The thought of her knowing that I wasn't the stereotypical strong black woman oozing an endless stream of black girl magic out of my pores made me feel sick. As far as I was concerned, she knew the narrative that I was supposed to be living by. Like Maya Angela said in her poem, we rise. No matter what's going on, we rise. I have the word tattooed onto my wrist, a permanent reminder of the fact we rise. If I opened up to this counsellor fully, then she would know that I was failing. So I didn't. She didn't catch me at the right time in my journey. The second counsellor was a much better fit for me then. Perhaps I could speak more openly to my kin now. I've done the prep work. There are levels to this. So many of the bumps in my road involved conversations with healthcare professionals. But we will never know for sure if any of them would have caught me before I fell. I have had multiple miscarriages. I am one in 100. But every time, after carefully making sure that there was definitely no remnants of what was supposed to be my tiny baby left in my room, nobody checked on my brain. I lived in a children's hospital with my daughter for six months, commuting from there to work and back again. After being discharged as a single mum, I was expected to administer her daily painful injections by myself. I couldn't cope. So why did I have to fight for the right to change her treatment? The doctors and nurses were outstanding with my daughter. She was so happy in their care. But nobody checked in with me. I often wonder if the people caring for my dad knew that I was there at home. Was anybody wondering how I was feeling, what the impact of seeing my strong, proud, loving dad deteriorate might be? Probably not, because we were all fine and the right questions weren't being asked at the right time. When I first called to book my counselling sessions, I remember being asked, have you had suicidal thoughts? And of course I said no, because I had no intention of killing myself. But if I'd been asked, if sometimes I wished I wasn't here, Or if sometimes I thought that maybe it might be kind of wonderful if I just happened to go to sleep and just not wake up the next day, then my answer would have been yes, often. When it comes to suicide in the UK, middle-aged men are at highest risk. My dad never made up the numbers that make up that statistic because his suicide attempt failed. I didn't even know it happened. I wasn't even too young. 
it's just that not visiting him in hospital was my normal and we didn't talk about it. And now we can't talk about it. There are so many conversations that I wish I'd had with my dad. So many conversations I wish I'd had with my dad. And so many questions that I wish I'd asked. So many things that I wish I'd explained. One in four adults and one in 10 children experienced mental health issues. He was one in four and I was one in 10. There are so many conversations I wish I'd had with my dad, but somebody needed to go first. I am now one in four and my daughter is 11. I am hoping that if she is one in 10, she will know for sure that she can talk to me. I try to lead by example. I can do this. We can do this. When I ask, how are you feeling? I mean, how are you feeling? I'm fine is not the full stop. I'm fine is just the beginning. My daughter is the beginning of a new narrative for us. Or maybe the new story started with me. The I in the word rise that I have permanently etched onto my skin is a semicolon. A semicolon is used when an author could have decided to end their sentence, but chose not to. I am the author and the sentence is my life. I persevere. I am strong enough to be vulnerable and brave enough to go first. I am Rachel. I'm not always fine and still I rise. I have anxiety and depression and still I rise. Sometimes the world feels a little bit heavy and still I rise. Isn't that just a little bit magical. <laughs>